Minerals are the building block components for rocks, and we now know of more than 5,000 mineral species. From actinolite to zoocyte, there are a lot of really cool minerals out there. But let's start by reviewing the major types of rock forming minerals and their physical properties. Shown here is the mineral hanksite from Cyril's Lake, California. Hanksite is a type of salt mineral, not just sodium chloride, it's specifically a sodium potassium sulfate carbonate chloride. Atoms, when arranged in an orderly fashion, can together compose larger molecules and compounds, or minerals, which in turn make up the rocks that we see all around us. For example, specific proportions of the elements silicon and oxygen, covalently bonded together in an orderly continuous framework, form the mineral quartz. And quartz is one of several rock-forming minerals, together with feldspar and biotite, that compose the rock-type granite. Several requirements must be satisfied for a substance to be considered a mineral. First, it must be inorganic and not consist of living matter. It should be noted that some minerals, like calcite, may be biochemical in origin, as they are produced by organisms to form shell material. Next, it must have a definite chemical composition. For example, quartz is always SiO2, one part silicon, two parts oxygen not SiO or SiO3. Galena is always PBS, one part lead, one part sulfur, not PBS2 or PB2S. It also must have an orderly internal structure. The difference between the mineral quartz and window glass is that window glass lacks a rigid crystalline framework. Natural inorganic materials having a definite chemical composition but no orderly internal structure are known as mineraloids and include various types of glass. Lastly, it must be naturally occurring. Of all the prerequisites, to me, this one seems the most arbitrary. I mean, if a substance satisfies all the other requirements, why should it matter that it can be artificially replicated in a lab? Well, rules are rules. Minerals cannot be man-made. There are several major classes of minerals that comprise most rocks that we will ever encounter. About 200 minerals are known as rock-forming minerals. We will review each mineral class in a minute, but I have summarized the entire discussion in one diagram, a concept map, which is a graphical summary that shows the relations between various terms and concepts. Just about any lecture topic we cover in this class can be represented as a concept map. For instance, here's a concept map that describes rock forming minerals. Although it's somewhat crude, my chicken scratch drawing, it effectively sums up the subject of rock forming minerals. There are many different ways you can lay these things out. I've chosen to put the main topic in the middle and surround it by the subtopics, kind of a wheel design. Linking words can be added between concepts so the map can read like a sentence. Simple sketches or images can be included, and information or links can be color-coded for easy identification. So concept maps can provide another way for us to comprehend and remember material. Let's look at this rock-forming mineral concept map a little bit more closely. Rock-forming minerals are grouped into several classes based on their chemical composition. I've just read essentially the inner part of the concept map, and that's what defines the different rock-forming mineral classes, their composition. Well, what are the compositions? What are the different mineral classes? Well, there they are, the silicates, carbonates, native elements, sulfides, sulfates, oxides, hydroxides, halides. I know that the silicates are kind of the most important rock-forming mineral group, so I left the most room for those. And the silicates are based on silicon and oxygen. Specifically, one silicon bound together covalently to four oxygen, and then uh, you add other elements to make different kinds of silicate minerals. These silicate ions, SiO4, make up these little pyramidal structures called a silica tetrahedron. 
that's kind of the simplistic way to portray the atomic structure of a silicate ion, which is bound together with other elements to form different silicate minerals. And they include, on the simple structural end, olivine, and they get more complex, forming chains and double chains and sheets and even three-dimensional framework structures, which is what quartz and feldspar are. And so my very rudimentary chicken scratch drawings here kind of get that across that you go from more simple to more complex. Drawing the silicon tetrahedron is somewhat important. So it can be a crude but effective drawing. You don't have to be a Rembrandt. I also added a little more information here about silicate minerals. Certain kinds of silicate minerals are dark minerals because they have more iron and magnesium and calcium, and they are most abundant in the mantle and oceanic crust. And then you have the lighter non-ferromagnesium minerals, the ones that lack iron, magnesium, calcium. They have other elements like potassium, sodium, aluminum, and they occur more in the continental crust. Moving around, we have the carbonates, which is another very important mineral group. That is basically carbon and three oxygens laid out. The carbonate ion bound with other elements to form carbonate minerals. The most common one is calcite, which is calcium and carbon and three oxygen, calcium carbonate. And that's an important sedimentary mineral for sedimentary rocks. We have native elements, which are made of one element, typically bound with the same element. This could be gold, it could be silver, it could be copper. These are the native elements. Diamond is considered a native element because it's basically carbon bound together very strongly with covalent bonds. Sulfides are minerals that are some element plus sulfur. And that could be a lead sulfide, galena. It could be an iron sulfide, pyrite, fool's gold. We have sulfates, which are some element plus sulfur and four oxygens. A sulfate is a SO4 ion. Calcium sulfate would be gypsum. That's a very important sedimentary mineral as well. Oxides, elements plus oxygen. Iron oxides are very common, and there's different varieties of iron oxides. Water ice is basically an oxide. Hydroxide, something plus OH. The important aluminum mineral, bauxite, is one of those. And then halides, something plus chlorine. Typically, sodium plus chlorine, sodium chloride, uh, that is rock salt. And that is a halide. So these are the major classes of minerals, all more or less described in this rock-forming mineral concept map. Silicate minerals make up a very important group of rock-forming minerals. The basic structural unit of silicate minerals is composed of the SiO4 anion. SiO4, one silicon atom and four oxygens, with a valence of negative four, so it wants to bond, and it does. So this anion in the form of a silica tetrahedron has the silicon atom in the center, covalently very strongly bonded with four oxygen atoms around it. There's various ways this can be portrayed, kind of a map view, atomic diagram there, a ball model of the atoms where you can't see the silicon in the middle there, the ball and stick model, uh, geometric sketch, etc. There's different ways you can portray these things. The SiO4 anion attracts various cations. Remember cations, positively charged. And these would include magnesium, iron, aluminum, etc. So all silicate minerals contain the element silicon and oxygen, plus some combination of other elements. Eight of the 92 naturally occurring elements compose more than 98% of Earth's crust. You can see that oxygen and silicon make up roughly three quarters of the total by themselves. So it makes sense that there's an abundance of minerals that include oxygen and silicon. Silicate minerals, fundamentally constructed with oxygen and silicon, compose more than 90% of the minerals in the Earth's crust. Feldspars are about half of these minerals and include plagioclase feldspar, making up 39%, and alkali feldspar, 12%. Quartz is also abundant at 12%, followed by pyroxene, and then amphibole, mica, the clay minerals, and other silicates. The non-silicates make up the last 8%, and those would be the sulfides and 
sulfates and halides, etc. The silicate minerals are subdivided into several major groups, each having its own distinct arrangement of silica tetrahedra. Structures composed of isolated tetrahedra are termed nesosilicates. These are the simplest structures, and they progressively become more complex and include rings or cyclosilicates, single and double chained silicates, termed inosilicates, sheet silicates, also called phyllosilicates, and three dimensional framework silicates or tectosilicates. Nesosilicates. Nesosilicates are silicate minerals based on isolated silica tetrahedra, connected only by intervening cations like iron, magnesium, etc., and include the minerals olivine, garnet, zircon, and aluminosilicates like kyanite. Olivine is actually a group of minerals with similar structure but slightly different compositions, and so have different names. The magnesium rich Forsterite and iron-rich phaolite are the two most common varieties. Olivine actually displays what's called solid solution, meaning that there's a range of compositions in between forsterite and phaolite that are possible. What that means is you can have an olivine that is 100% magnesium, 0% iron, and that's forsterite. You could also, under different conditions, have olivine that's 0% magnesium and 100% iron, that's phaolite. And you can have any number in between, say 73% magnesium and 27% iron. And that's called solid solution. Olivine is typically glassy, granular, and green in color. Gem quality olivine is called peridote. Olivine is an important rock forming mineral and is common in mafic and ultramafic igneous rocks. Like olivine, Garnet is a group of several minerals with similar physical properties and crystal form that are slightly different in chemical composition and color. Of the different species of garnet, pyrope, almondine, spessartine, and grossular are the most common compositions. Garnet is an important index mineral in metamorphic rocks, and its hardness makes it a great abrasive material. Zircon is a nesosilicate that is hard, heat-resistant, and typically contains radioactive uranium-238, making it ideal as an abrasive material and for isotopic dating purposes. It originally forms in felsic igneous rocks, but is also commonly found in sandy sediments and sandstones. Inosilicates are the chain silicates. Single-chained inosilicates are those with chains of linked silica tetrahedra, with interspersed cations like magnesium, iron, sodium, calcium, etc. The single-chained inosilicates include the pyroxene group, which is a collection of more than 20 mineral species that are slightly different in composition. This diagram here shows their layout, and just like with olivine, there is a range of different compositions from more magnesium-rich pyroxenes to more iron-rich pyroxenes. And calcium is a third component, and some pyroxenes are more rich in calcium. So, augite is the most common type of pyroxene. Pigeonite is also common. Enstatite and ferrocyte are the most magnesium and iron rich pyroxenes, respectively. And you can also get diopside and hedenbergite. These different pyroxenes display a range of colors from black to dark green to army green. They are typically slender in length and blocky in cross-section due to their two cleavage planes that intersect at about 90 degrees. So you see little corners in these pyroxene minerals. Pyroxenes are abundant in mafic and ultramafic igneous and metamorphic rocks. The double-chained inosilicates are slightly more complex in structure and are hydrous. Minerals containing water in their crystalline structure are considered hydrous minerals. The amphibole group is a collection of more than a dozen mineral species that are slightly different in composition. This diagram here shows some of them. Some are magnesium rich, like anthophyllite, and there's a continuum over to the iron rich amphiboles, grunerite, with coming tonight in between. Then there's slightly more calcium rich 
amphiboles, and those include tremolite and actinolite. But the most abundant amphibole is hornblende. It's more sodium rich, and it's not on this diagram. While the amphiboles can show a range in colors, they're typically black. Amphibole crystals are slender and may be diamond shaped in cross section due to their two intersecting planes of cleavage, 6120 intersection and a diamond shaped cross section. These minerals are abundant in both igneous and metamorphic rocks. Phyllosilicates are the sheet silicates and contain parallel sheets of silica tetrahedra. These minerals are also hydrous in that they contain water in their crystalline structure. The bonds connecting the atoms in any given sheet are typically much stronger than the bonds that are connecting adjacent sheets. This gives the minerals the ability to peel apart. Thus, these minerals are said to have one preferred plane of cleavage called basal cleavage and commonly break between the sheets. There are several important types of sheet silicates. The mica group is comprised of many different varieties, including biotite and muscovite. Biotite is the dark mica due to its iron and magnesium content. Muscovite is the white mica due to its lack of iron and magnesium. When you look at the chemical formula here, you can see magnesium and iron make up some portion of biotite, whereas those two elements are lacking in muscovite. The presence or absence of those two elements is directly responsible for color. Magnesium iron, darker biotite, lack of magnesium and iron, lighter muscovite. These two minerals are abundant in many different types of rocks. There are also many varieties of chlorite, which is typically greenish in color and very common in metamorphic rocks. Serpentine is a group of several different minerals that include different varieties of asbestos. Finally, there are numerous types of clay minerals, which are abundant in soils and sedimentary rocks. Tectosilicates are complex three-dimensional frameworks of silica tetrahedra. This group of silicate minerals includes some of the most common rock-forming minerals. Quartz has a very simple composition, SiO2, but includes many different varieties with a range of colors, from clear quartz to amethyst, rose quartz, smoky quartz, milky quartz. Quartz is a very abundant mineral and is found in many types of rocks. Compositional note, the composition of quartz is SiO2. A chemist might call that silicon dioxide. We just call it silica. The element Si is silicon, and if you ever hear the term silicone, that's something else that isn't geologic in nature. The feldspar family represents the most abundant rock-forming minerals. There are several different species, and you can see in this ternary diagram here, they range from calcium-rich to sodium-rich to potassium-rich. The two major groups are alkali feldspar, rich in sodium and potassium, and there are several different kinds, from albite, which is more sodium-rich, to orthoclase, which is more potassium-rich, and then the plagioclase feldspars, which range from albite at the sodium end all the way to anorthite at the calcium-rich end. And so, just like in some of the other minerals, there's a range of different compositions, we call that solid solution. So there's different types of feldspars. You can see in the chemical composition, alkali feldspar goes from potassium-rich to sodium-rich, and plagioclase is sodium-rich to calcium-rich. Feldspars are typically light in color because they lack iron and magnesium, although the calcium-rich plagioclase feldspars can be darker in color. They are blocky due to their two planes of cleavage that intersect at about 90 degrees. And these minerals are also very common and are found in many types of rocks. Carbonate minerals are an important mineral group. In these minerals, the carbonate anion CO3, will seek to bond with atoms having a plus two valence, like calcium or magnesium. There are over 30 different species of carbonate minerals. However, calcite and dolomite are the most common. Calcite, or calcium carbonate, displays different crystal habits, 
and can form crystals like this pointy scalenohedron. Calcite also commonly breaks along three planes of cleavage, one of which intersects the other at less than 90 degrees, which forms a shape that is rhombohedral. So calcite is said to have rhombic cleavage. One variety of calcite is known as optical calcite or Iceland spar. It has the unique property of double refraction. So it's crystalline structures such that it splits the rays of light into two, so you see double. But most famously, calcite readily reacts with dilute hydrochloric acid. This is an incredibly powerful diagnostic tool for a field geologist. And this mineral is abundant in many sedimentary rocks. Dolomite, or calcium magnesium carbonate, is very similar to calcite in most respects. It can be very hard to tell the difference and I often refer to dolomite as calcite's evil twin. An important difference though is that dolomite does not react readily with dilute hydrochloric acid. You actually have to powder the mineral a little bit, put the hydrochloric on it, and it'll weakly react, but not like calcite does. Native elements are actually minerals. Minerals composed only of one element. Native elements are important sources of metals like copper, gold, and silver, as well as nonmetals like sulfur and carbon. Native carbon has more than one crystalline form, which makes it a polymorph. One polymorph of carbon is the mineral graphite, which has a sheet-like atomic structure that makes it relatively weak. Conversely, diamond is a carbon polymorph having strong covalent bonds and is one of the hardest known minerals. Sulfides are minerals with sulfur as the major anion. Sulfides commonly form ore minerals with economically important metals, including iron, copper, lead, and zinc. Pyrite is a well-known sulfide, also known as fool's gold. Pyrite can form shiny, blocky, striated crystals. Sorry, there's no gold in pyrite, just iron and sulfur. But that's a pretty cool-looking mineral. Chalcopyrite is similar to pyrite, but includes copper, and tends to have a more brassy luster. Bornite is a copper iron sulfide that displays iridescence, or a play of colors. This display of colors gives it the nickname peacock ore. And galena is a lead sulfide that forms dull to shiny cubes. Galena is one of Dr. Bob's personal favorites. Sulfates are minerals with SO4 as the major anion, which commonly bonds with plus two valence cations like calcium, magnesium, barium, etc. This mineral group includes many different members. There are about 200 or so hydrous and anhydrous mineral species. Remember, minerals containing water in their crystalline structure are considered hydrous. Sulfates are relatively soft and typically form as evaporite minerals in various sedimentary environments. Gypsum is a very common calcium sulfate and has many constructive uses. Anhydrite is the anhydrous version of gypsum. Barite or barium sulfate commonly occurs as a vein deposit. In the oxide group, oxygen is the major anion. Oxides include many different minerals with various origins. Hematite is an iron oxide that is very common, and it's a very important economic ore mineral. Hematite ranges from silvery gray in color to blood red. Spinel is an important oxide mineral too, it's common in Earth's mantle and also in some meteorites. Finally, water ice is an oxide mineral as it has a hexagonal crystalline structure. The last group of minerals that we'll talk about are the halides. In these minerals, chlorine is the major anion, but could include anions like fluorine, bromine, or iodine. Most halides are salt minerals with many compositional varieties. Halite, or sodium chloride, is also known as rock salt. The word halite is actually Greek for salt. 
Halite can have many different colors. For example, pink halite found in some brine pools gets its characteristic pink color from the salt-tolerant halobacteria it contains. Sylvite, or potassium chloride, is another halide mineral, and both halite and sylvite are common evaporite minerals. Fluorite has an assortment of colored varieties and is found in many different types of rocks, sometimes in crystalline cavities known as geodes. There are so many different minerals, how do we tell one from another? Well, we use their various physical properties. Each mineral has a distinct physical property or set of properties that allow it to be identified and distinguished. This concept map here illustrates some of these different types of physical properties, which include color, streak, luster, cleavage, fracture, hardness, specific gravity, magnetism, and others. Let's start with a physical property of color. Minerals can have many colors, as we've seen. But the color of a mineral is actually the light leaving their surface, which normally depends on a couple things. One is the type of illuminating light, the type of light shining on the mineral, which might be ultraviolet light, could be white light, could be infrared. And two, the reflectance properties of the mineral itself, which are largely dependent on the composition and crystalline structure of the mineral. Color can be very distinctive, but can also be highly variable, usually due to small amounts of impurities within the mineral crystal. Quartz is notorious for having different colored forms, from clear quartz to rose quartz, milky quartz, purple quartz or amethyst, smoky quartz. Thus, color is easy to identify but is not always a reliable diagnostic physical property when identifying minerals. Streak is the color of a mineral when it is powdered. The streak test is typically accomplished by rubbing the mineral against a porcelain streak plate and then observing the color of the powdered streak. Hematite, for example, produces a nice dark gray streak. Minerals with metallic luster typically leave colored streaks, whereas non-metallic minerals generally do not leave colored streaks. Luster is a measure of how light interacts with the surface of a mineral. There are two basic types of luster, metallic and non-metallic. Metallic luster is produced by strong reflections from the mineral surface, making it look shiny, like a metal. Many of the sulfide ore minerals, like galena and pyrite, display metallic luster. There are many non-metallic varieties of luster, ranging from vitreous to resinous, greasy, earthy, and so on. Most minerals have non-metallic lusters, as shown by plagioclase feldspar and halite. Mineral hardness is a measure of resistance to being scratched. Friedrich Mohs came up with a relative scale of hardness, the Mohs scale of hardness describes the hardness of different minerals relative to each other. The lower the number on the scale, the softer the mineral. The higher the number on the scale, the harder the mineral. We can easily test the hardness of a mineral by rubbing it with materials of known hardness, like a fingernail, penny, steel knife, plate of glass, and then observe which material is scratched, thus softer. For instance, I try scratching a piece of quartz with my fingernail, to no avail. Thus I know the quartz is harder than my fingernail. So then I try other items, harder items, and try to scratch the quartz. Not even steel of my Swiss Army knife will scratch it. Not even glass. In fact, the quartz scratches the glass. Thus I know quartz is harder than all of these things. Quartz has a ranking of 7 on Mohs scale and is a pretty hard mineral. Cleavage is the tendency of a mineral to split along definite planes of weakness formed by its crystalline structure. Minerals may have more than one plane of weakness, or a cleavage plane, and when more than one is present, we typically number the planes and the angles at which they intersect. 
For example, the phyllosilicates typically have one plane of cleavage formed between the different sheets of silica tetrahedra. Thus, minerals like biotite can be split easily into sheets or flakes, sometimes so thin that the flakes are translucent and even transparent. Feldspar and pyroxene are minerals with two planes of cleavage intersecting at right angles, thus forming small repeating corners in the mineral. Amphibole has two planes of cleavage that intersect at 60 degrees and 120 degrees, giving diamond-shaped cross-sections. Halite is a mineral with three planes of cleavage that all intersect at right angles, forming cubic structures. Calcite has three planes of cleavage too, but one of the planes intersects the other at less than 90 degrees, forming rhombic shapes instead of cubes. There are minerals with more than three planes of cleavage, but these can be pretty hard to identify. Some minerals do not have preferred planes of weakness and break in a random fashion. This is called the fracture and is well displayed by the mineral quartz. One way to describe the heaviness of a mineral is with specific gravity, which is a number representing the ratio between the weight of the mineral and the weight of an equal volume of water. For example, the specific gravity of liquid water is 1.0. Most rock forming minerals have a specific gravity between 2.0 and 4.5. Specific gravity greater than 4.5 is considered heavy and is typified by many metallic ore minerals. Crystal form describes a mineral's characteristic set of symmetrical crystal faces when it is formed under ideal conditions and is allowed to grow freely. There are many different crystal forms that belong to a handful of geometric crystal systems. Crystal habit is the typical appearance of a mineral or a cluster of minerals. There is a wide range of descriptive crystal habits, including columnar, acicular, bladed, fibrous, platy, etc. Other important physical properties include magnetism, effervescence, fluorescence, crystal striations, and more. Some minerals are strongly attracted to a magnetic field, or even a magnet. The mineral magnetite is an iron ore and is the most magnetic mineral known. Effervescence is the release of gas from a mineral as it reacts with an acid. The mineral calcite will effervesce as carbon dioxide is generated during the reaction with dilute hydrochloric acid. This is a powerful test for the presence of calcite. Fluorescence is the emission of light from a mineral after absorbing ultraviolet light. Some varieties of the minerals calcite and willemite can display strong fluorescence. Very cool. Crystal growth patterns, or crystal habits, may form distinctive fine parallel grooves or striations, as seen in plagioclase feldspar and pyrite. Well, that's all for now. Till next time. <laughs>